The Foreseen Arcade. Active. Ever since Microsoft launched the Xbox 360 in 2005, we were introduced to the achievement system. Every game had challenges you could accomplish where every achievement will grant you gamer score. This was a brilliant new way to show your bragging rights to your buddies, be it online or in the real world. Sony would later follow suit with a firmware update to the PlayStation 3, where we could get its own equivalent called trophies. Instead of gamer score, the PlayStation Network trophies are instead labeled by four types. Bronze, Silver, Gold and Secret trophies. And the reward for completing all of them? You will unlock the Platinum Trophy. It's a way of rewarding the player for mastering everything the game has to offer. Obviously, those became an afterthought in the recent years, thanks to shovelware developers popping out quote-unquote paid platinum games on the PlayStation 4, 5 and PlayStation Vita, and easy thousand gamer score games on Xbox One and Xbox Series X and S, as well as the fact that server closures make platinum trophies impossible to obtain today. But at the end of the day, most of the games still strike a balance in terms of difficulty. Oh yeah, and I cannot forget about the PC and Android devices, as unlike PlayStation and Xbox systems, achievement support is optional for games released via Steam, Epic Games, Google Play Store, and GOG.com thanks to the Galaxy client. The client, by the way, is also optional, being that GOG games themselves are DRM free. But what about older consoles and computers? All the systems that were made long before the Xbox 360. Well, what if I told you that there is a website that allows you to earn achievements for retro games? Enter Retro Achievements, a website originally created by a former programmer for Rare in 2012 that allows you to earn community-made achievements through emulation. At first we only had Mega Drive, with Sonic the Hedgehog being the first game to start off. Fast forward to 2024, and now we have 51 supported systems. More options for emulators other than RA Libretro or RetroArch, and over 9000 plus games with achievement support. I have known this site for many years, and I always wanted to talk about it on the Foreseen Arcade at some point, but now it's a perfect opportunity for me to do one. Today's video is for the games that I believe should get an achievement set and what ideas could it have for any aspiring developer, be it a core developer or a junior developer. I've been looking forward to making it and finally test out the microphone so I could finally make a commentary for a video. So, without further ado, let's begin. Let's begin with an easy game to talk about, and one that I originally had plans to do a set for myself, until I gave up on set development after making the set for the unlicensed SG-1000 port of an MSX port of Rally X. Released as a PAL exclusive, Truck Racing was a budget game released in 2002 by Midas Interactive, the same folks who brought Dynasty Warriors 2 for the European audience. Right off the bat, you may be asking, hang on, why does this game remind me of Firestar Racing, which does have an achievement set? To answer that question, that's because this was developed by Kung Fu Limited, the same studio who made Five Star Racing. It even uses the same engine as Five Star Racing. And frankly, the same can be said for some of our other releases, including All Star Racing 1 and 2, Formula GP, Truck Rally, yes, there really was a sequel, Superbike Masters. Stock Car Racer and their PlayStation 2 release, 
extreme speed, despite the back of a box claiming that it was developed by mere mortals. I don't know if they used the same engine as their debut game, Melee Megillia, but hey, who knows. Truck racing is as simple of a premise as you can get. It's a racing game where you drive trucks. You have the simple options for difficulty and how many laps in a race, from 3 laps up to 15. There are 8 tracks to race on and 6 color styles for the truck. Much like 5 star racing, using directional buttons is not exactly an ideal method for steering, so it might be best to set the controller settings to DualShock and use the left analog stick. The handling isn't bad for a budget game, though I would recommend the far away option for the camera as the trucks are pretty tall vehicles, so they aren't exactly ideal for racing in real life. Or you could switch to the first person camera if you want. The tracks are also pretty neat for a budget game, which gives us the grounded for the racing vibes. Sunny Banks, Mashbury Park and Isla Raceway being the highlights. As for the AI? Well, on easy it is a breeze and a good way to choose that difficulty level if you are aiming to focus on beating the developer's lap records. Medium, which is the default difficulty level, is where we get proper racing, even if the AI opponents are still no match for your truck. But the hard difficulty? Well, they may be the hardest AI, but unlike 5 star racing where the AI is very tough on hard, truck racing's AI still has a hard time catching up to you. So yeah, truck racing is a lot easier than 5 star racing, but what are the ideas for achievements? Obviously the set will have achievements requiring you to finish first on each of the 8 tracks on all 3 difficulty levels and lap options, but they have some additional ideas like beating the game developer's lap record, winning a race on sunny banks without bumping into a wall, winning a race on Rivermead with the first person camera option, and winning a race on Alton Raceway using only the direction of buttons for steering. Ah, Worms. One of my all-time favorite series, and my personal game of choice when strategy games are concerned. Whether it's the classic games, the 3D trilogy on the PlayStation 2, the PSP trilogy, being Open Warfare 1, 2, and Battle Islands, or even the modern games like WMD and Rumble, there is nothing more fun and satisfying than blowing up your friend's worms with grenades, airstrikes, mines, bazookas, farm animals, fruit, a multi-python reference, and many other ridiculous ways. The 1995 original saw plenty of ports, yet the only version to get a set on Retro Achievements is the Saturn version as part of a second Retro Achievements Dev Jam. So this entry will focus on the ideas for the PlayStation version. I would have loved to choose the 16-bit counterpart for the Mega Drive or the surprisingly lesser known Atari Jaguar version, but I am saving those two platforms for another day. While the PlayStation 1 version will have, will have most, if not all, of the achievements from the Saturn set, I think I can add some additional ideas for this one to expand a little bit. When looking at weapons, I think there could I think there will be achievements for winning rounds by using only specific types of weapon. For example, winning a round using only close combat 
with like Fire Punch and Dragon Ball around using only grenades. Using only the shotgun or an Uzi. And just for a laugh, killing a worm by pushing one into the water, all from a great height, with a prod. Speaking of kills, it could also expand the kills bit by killing worms on any session, setting a worm out of bounds, or by drowning enemy worms. Those are my possible ideas on expanding the ideas for the PlayStation 1 set of worms. If anyone wants to do a revision for the Saturn version, I think the custom level codes could be Sega themed, referencing other Saturn titles, maybe first party games. Let's hope my ideas will make the cut for whoever decides to pick this one up. With the recent delisting of Ziggurat's Retro Classics line off of Steam and GOG.com due to licensing with Data Eats current IP owner Gmode Corporation expiring, I didn't manage to upload gameplay videos of all the 12 games in the collection when they were all at their final sale. The quality of the ports were a mixed bag to say the least, but it was interesting to see some of the lesser known Data East arcade games being released on modern platforms, besides the familiar ones like Bad Dudes, Heavy Barrel, Night Slashers, and in this case, Joe and Mac. In fact, Joe and Mac were represented in a collection with two games, Caveman Ninja and the game I chose for this video, Joe and Mac Return. In stark contrast to the original game, this is an elimination platformer, the subgenre Data East previously dabbled in with the other game they made before, Tumble Pop. In fact, the official description for the Retro Classics release even calls Joel's and Mac Returns as a spiritual sequel. Once again, you take the role of the two titular cavemen who are on a quest to rescue their girlfriends from the pesky Neanderthals, dinosaurs, mammals, fish, aliens and robots, for some reason. No idea what's up with the last two existing in the Stone Age, but what else do you expect from Data East? The game is pretty fun, hilarious and pretty addicting but I imagine that besides progression achievements and power-up achievements, I bet there could be more challenging achievements like beating a world without continues, reaching high scores and maybe some other clever ways to put limitations on a challenge. And while I'm at it, I think I could also suggest a set for other Data East arcade games in the Retro Classics line, with my personal recommendations being Super Burger Time, Express Raider, either that or its PSP Minis release, and Too Crude. While the 3 do interactive multiplayer is mainly remembered by many for the infamous plumbers don't wear ties and the notoriously disastrous port of Doom, it did have some decent games that more than make up for it, whereas the original Need for Speed, Alone in the Dark 1 and 2, the 3DO ports of Wolfenstein 3D, Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo, and Samurai Showdown, the best version of the 32-bit Road Rash, and of course, the earliest works of Crystal Dynamics, best known for Legacy of Kane, Gex, and the modern Tomb Raider games. However, there were some oddities in the library, like some of Japan exclusive games from the late Kenji Eno and his studio Warp Inc., the Bizarre Fighter Balls Director's Cut, and Captain Quasar. 
and of course, like many CD-based jack of all trades multimedia consoles like the CD TV or the Philips CDI, the 3DO has its fair share of educational software. Yes, who? Oh, and three compilations of Woody Woodpecker cartoons. Because why not? But there was one game in the library that happens to be a combination of both. Originally released for the Mega Drive and Super Nintendo in 1993 and 1994 respectively, the 3DO version is what I consider the best version in terms of how much content it has. Much like the 16-bit counterparts, Fun and Games has a painting tool, a music making tool, a mix and match type of thing, and a dress up game. Awesome! Wow! As much as one would like to, to add achievements to those modes, well, let's not forget the games. The 3DO version has 5 games, which is 2 more, or 3 more, compared to the Mega Drive and Super Nintendo versions. Max and Maxine is a Maze Chief game where you control as one of the titular white mice as you collect all the cheese pieces while avoiding enemies. Collecting candies will make Max and Maxine huge and can take down the enemies for a while. Sliding puzzle is self-explanatory but it does have plenty of pictures to solve and 4 difficulty levels to increase the complexity. Whereabout is essentially a game of memory or concentration where you need to find the matching pairs. Aqua Shark is an R-type style game that takes place underwater, though the ship you are steering is more of a lobster than a shark. And finally we have Space Cadet, which is a third person sci-fi shunema. Sure, the set may be pretty simple, but the amount of content in the game itself will make it worthwhile. While the paint, music and style achievements will qualify as 3 points fodder, the games, especially Max and Maxine and the two shoot 'em ups will definitely balance it out thanks to the potential of tough challenges like deathless runs, no candy runs and no hint runs for both sliding puzzle and whereabouts. While the Mega Drive and Super Nintendo versions are more tempting for developers due to both being popular systems, the 3DO version is the most definitive version, so I recommend that this version will get a set. Much like how the board game itself has an absurd amount of variations, Monopoly has a lot of digital adaptations throughout the years. For every system generation, we see a Monopoly game with varying degree of quality, considering that many different developers have taken a crack at it. Whether it's the 16-bit and 8-bit adaptation by Sculpture Software, the PlayStation version by Gremlin Interactive, or Ubisoft's modern release with Monopoly Plus, it seems that everyone wants to take turns to bring this classic board game to consoles, computers and handhelds. Heck, I made gameplay videos of several adaptations as well. There were even PC versions of the Spongebob and Star Wars editions of all things. Looking at the Monopoly series hub on retro achievements, we have achievement sets for the NES, Master System, Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Mega Drive, Super Nintendo, PlayStation, and Nintendo 64 versions. I was torn on which one I should focus on for this video, but between the MSX, Game Boy Advance, and the PSP versions, I went to the PSP version since it was pretty nostalgic to me. In 2010, Electronic Arts created a PSP port of their 2008 version of Monopoly that was available for the Wii, Xbox 360, and both the PlayStation 2 and PlayStation 3. However, the PSP version was heavily stripped down compared to the home console counterparts, with notable omissions being the minigames, the richest edition mode, and online play. You don't even get to see Mr. Monopoly himself appearing 
on a board. But considering this port was released for the Minis lineup, which the file size is generally low and were sold at a budget price, it's pretty understandable. For the achievements, I would expect the usual for every Monopoly game. All color groups, railroads and services, build houses or hotels, you get the idea. But since the PSP Mini's release retains the unlockable boards that change the properties, board, chance and community chest cards for the specific team, I think that it would be a perfect idea to add achievements for those as well. Although I would have loved to see the set for the PlayStation 2 version, which has more meat on the bones, so to speak. The PSP version will be a good way to bring out the best Monopoly set for the handheld side of retro achievements. Yes, even more than the Game Boy and Game Boy Color versions. Next we have International Moto X, an early 3D motocross game by Craft Gold, the same studio behind Fire and Ice and some of the iconic Commodore 64 games including Paradroid, Gribbly Stay Out, Alley Cat and Uridium. Released in 1996, it was Craft Gold's first game they released for the PlayStation. And their last. In fact, this was Craft Gold's final game. Alongside the Rainbow Islands portion of Bubble Bubble featuring Rainbow Islands compilation, Craft Gold closed its stores sometime in 1998 and had their IPs sold to Jester Interactive. Jester Interactive was developing a Game Boy Advance title, Uridium Advance and Paradroid, but it never saw the light of day which is a damn shame. International Moto X, whose PlayStation version was only released in Europe and Japan, features 30 tracks to race on across each of the four continents, three game modes, and perhaps most interesting of all, a tournament and track editor. Up to 16 custom tracks on a single memory card in fact. That's quite an accomplishment for a game made in 1996, and what an impressive feat for what is basically the last hurrah for Craft Gold. There is the practice mode, a time trial mode and tournament, so each of the modes would have achievements. In tournament mode in particular, you can also earn cash that can be used to repair or upgrade your vehicle between races, so that can inspire achievement ideas for winning a tournament without upgrades or repairs as well as fully upgrading a bike. And while the base game itself can be doable, International Moto X could also benefit from a Custom Tracks and Tournaments subset, where we can try beating tracks and tournaments made by other achie Retro Achievements developers, all using provided memory cards of course. Obviously, a lot of you would rather wait for the Commodore 64 support, since that is where the studio is more well known. But a set for International Moto X would definitely bring in more people to give Graph Gold's 32-bit swan song a chance, and maybe find an audience it deserves. Of course, there is no way I won't make a list like this without a classic arcade game everyone knows. Mappy, one of my all-time favorite arcade games, already has a set for the Famicom, Game Gear and MSX. But I am so as surprised as you are that there is no set for the original arcade version. As much as I am tempted to suggest the PC-8801 port that retains the bonus rounds, the ColecoVision homebrew port, which is itself a port of the MSX port, or the Famicom Mini release for the Game Boy Advance, I believe it will make sense that the arcade version should have a set. What else can I say about Mappy? 
I won't mind if a PC-8801 version is claimed too. We have some of the often known in television games on the retro achievements, including Astro Smash, Shark Shark, Thin Ice, Cloudy Mountain, Boss Bombers, Frog Bog, and Pinball. But even then, the fact that one of the other iconic in television games, Night Stalker, still has no set is pretty surprising, especially as the premise is pretty simple. Your aim in Night Stalker is to earn as many points as you can by taking down robots, spiders, and bats. But in order to actually shoot in either of the four directions, you need to pick up the gun in the maze. Plus, you shoot one at a time, so you may want to time your shots. And maybe even destroy two robots at once later in the game. Get hit by a robot or its laser shot and you lose a life. It's a simple game that is addictive enough to make it as one of my personal favorite games on the system. So I imagine that outside of a score achievement, it will also include surviving for like a minute or three without firing, destroying a number of robots, spiders and bats during a session, destroying robots by only shooting left and right or up and down, or emptying the ammo by killing the robots in a row. Basically, 9 robots with 9 bullets. The Intellivision is one of the more underappreciated systems of the era, when it competed with the likes of the Atari 2600, ColecoVision, the Odyssey 2 and Effectrex. So I imagine that this set would encourage the community to try out more of its first party releases. I honestly don't want to spend way too much time on my first video focused on retro achievements. But I do have some additional games to get out of the way before I show you one last segment. So here are some honorable mentions. Bloons TD for the PSP. Another minis offering, this one is based on Bloons TD 3, with additional content exclusive to the PSP release. We already have both TD games on the Nintendo DSi, so why should those systems have all the fun? High Octane This game may be seen as the poor man's wipeout, but Bullfrog's futuristic racer still deserves your attention be it via set for the PlayStation 1 version or the Saturn version. Pac-Man Arcade Emulator for the Amstrad CPC I am saving the topic of homebrew games for the future, but I still feel like including this one as this fan-made conversion of Pac-Man is so good, it feels like it should have been released during the CPC's commercial life for how faithful it is to the arcade release. Elemental Pinball for the PlayStation It's one of the smallest PS1 games in terms of file size, and possibly the smallest games on the PlayStation 1 in general. Even for the fact that its PAL release was published by Midas Interactive. And besides, it's Pinball. You can imagine how addictive it can be for those who just aim for completion on the side. And we don't even have any PlayStation 1 pinball games with achievements on retro achievements yet. So why not? Superfar for the PlayStation 2. Yes, your eyes do not deceive you. Not only this was made by the same studio as A Plague Tale. But the biggest kicker is that this was their debut game. And it never saw a release outside of Europe or the PlayStation 2. I have played the demo version on my PS2 quite a few times, as the full game was pretty hard to find, so thanks to its obscurity and rarity, this would definitely be a very interesting set. Maybe it could be the next hidden gem among the retro achievements community. 
or probably the next meme fodder for the retro achievement community if the absurdity of the game and its content is anything to go by. 10 Lines Hero for the MSX Apparently, a set for the game was being worked on before switching over to the sequel, 10 Lines Princess, instead. I tested the game myself on RetroArch, and I can pretty much see why. After posting a comment about it on the game's itch.io page, the updated version got added to the downloads that fixes the severe issues that prevented the game from being playable on RetroArch. And considering that the sequel has a set, this would be a perfect opportunity to give the original another chance, now that the fixed version is made accessible. Bubble Bubble also featuring Rainbow Islands. You know the compilation I brought up in the International Moto X segment? That's the compilation I'm talking about. While the original versions are ported to the PS1 and the Saturn by Probe Entertainment, Craft Gold was responsible for the enhanced version of Rainbow Islands. And like International Moto X was their last game, this compilation's enhanced version of Rainbow Islands was Craft Gold's final contribution before closing its doors in 1998. And I believe a set will make it a perfect tribute to their final work. And with that said, let's get to my last game of this video. And well, it's a big one. Yep, this game is the most popular video on the Far Scene Arcade. So it's natural that I will talk about this game. A sequel to the Nintendo 64 and PC game Tom and Jerry in Fists of Furry, War of the Whiskers adds refined gameplay and more stages and characters to play as, alongside the returning cast of a classic cartoon. Now there are unique hazards for the stages, you can now taunt and even grab and throw opponents, more items to use, and finally, you can charge up special bar that allows you to go berserk, meaning you can deal more damage for a short amount of time. And funnily enough, this is the only Tom and Jerry game, as well as the only game published by New Kid Co. to have a T rating. Since this was released in 2002, this was before we got the E10 Plus rating in the US. The ideas for achievements would include beating challenge mode with every character except for the bosses, some versus and tag versus achievements, winning a match, or challenge mode without co using any opponent grabs, blocking or berserk mode, pick up related ones, taking advantage of the hazards, and even achievements related to secret weapons, stages and costumes. War of the Whiskers has quite a lot of content that will make for a fine C achievement set, especially when you consider that it was released on a CD-ROM rather than a cartridge. If you enjoyed the Nintendo 64 set for Fists of Furry, I believe the sequel deserves any and all of your attention. And that's the end of my first Retro Achievements video. While I am not sure if the video will convince developers on the site to consider making a set for any of these featured games, well, either that or even bother not cringing over my Polish accent, I am sure I'll be looking forward to earning the achievements on them. If you have any thoughts on my picks, or if you have any suggestions for a new Retro Achievements video, be it a review, a trailer for a set, or maybe another list like this, either like a volume 2 or a video focused on system or homebrew, let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching and have a nice day.